Okay, this is well, leaving, so our first interview since James Weeks, and uh, this is none other than Brian Allison, who's running on the Libertarian ticket for U.S. Senate. U.S. Michigan. Senate. All right, you're. Take it easy, man. Um, yeah, you know, uh, um, you're going to be fighting, um, you know, against Debbie Stabenow and, and uh, the other senator from Michigan. So it's going to be a big ball game for you. Um, so let me ask you, um, why are you running? Well, a uh, couple reasons. I mean, uh, one, I've, I've kind of always wanted to seek uh, um, run for some type of higher office. I, I really didn't know exactly what office I wanted to run for. I just figured uh, when the opportunity presented itself that, that I would know. Um, yeah. So we knew that the uh, Libertarian Party, this is a big race for us. Yeah. We, we've got uh, major party status. We're going to have uh, uh, access on the primary uh elections so I thought it was really important that we had a, a good strong candidate right. I knew that um, James Weeks was going to be running and uh, I thought that uh, you know obviously we all know James and, and uh, he's a great guy and and uh, he's, a, he's and a I was supporting his campaign but since then I think he's pretty much dropped out yeah so um, but at the time you know obviously I didn't know he was going to drop out and um, I just knew that he was very divisive and I was afraid that he wouldn't get the support that he needed from the Libertarian Party and that he, he wouldn't be able to get on the ballot. And so I thought it was really important that we had a candidate and I uh, right. felt like I would be a good candidate. So um, I threw my hat out there and it's, I just f felt like the right time and the right thing to do. When did you throw in your hat? Uh, it was the, let's see, when did I announce? Like the first week of October, I think. Okay. Around that time. So it's been, it's been about a month ago. All right, so I guess um, um, you're you're running on some very good issues here, from what you showed me tonight. Um, you're running for taxes, spending. Um, you want to eliminate the U.S. income tax. Um, obviously, you want to get spending under control, or at least cut spending down to the bone. Um, you want to get the troops out of the Middle East. Um, very Ron Paul-esque. Um, you know, I guess my question for you is, give me a summary of what your uh, campaign is really all about and what issues are you focusing on throughout the course of your campaign? So really near and dear to me is the idea of demilitarization. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, being a combat veteran myself, um, having spent a year in the desert in Iraq uh, yeah. back in 2004, 2005, you know, I, and just having that firsthand experience and knowing what it's like and what it really means and, and the real impact that our presence in foreign countries has right. on people and it's not positive. And so, you know, that's, that's really important to me. I think that this the the way that the country has become with this right. pa this this uh, false patriotism and, and supporting uh, the military and the conquest and building empires around the world and I I just think that um, that's not something that that really represents Fantastic. what an American is and what Americans are and what we should be and so that's my that is my biggest issue I think is the de is demilitarization. And then, uh, you know, I have a, a, a real interest in economics. And so the, you know, second biggest issue is, is the uh, Federal Reserve System. And uh, ending the Fed, I think, is, uh, is critical. Um, Which is what Ron Paul brought up. Yep. Uh, yeah, same here, Frederick. Um, you know, I'm just curious, you mentioned you were a combat veteran. Um, which branch of the military were you in? I was in the army, so I was I was in the regular army. I joined the army when I was uh, eighteen. Okay. Uh, I joined and I did four years. I after. come from a marine family. My okay. Dad, my dad okay. was a marine. 
everybody, whenever he goes up to a Marine, they said Semper Fi, you know, so. Right. And he was in it for 12 years. He could have gone to Nam, but he chose his family over a tour of duty in, in Nam. And, but with the exception of my uncle, who was a military vet, and he went into um, Nam, he ended up, uh, it turns out years later, he was diagnosed with, uh, you know, uh, problems due to exposure to Agent Orange. Sure. So, but, uh, and by the way, I just want to say for my mom, um, it's great to meet a fellow veteran um, because this is an important issue because Fox News gives us this false dichotomy you're either for the troops or you're against the troops that's right and i guess my question is um what's your uh view of how fox news views the troops and all the army generals they have coming by the studios you know um, well, again, it's this, it's culture of militarism, right? It's that's that's what that's what we've become, and that's what Fox represents, and and it's you know this idea that uh, because we have this, you know, we spend, you know, God God knows how much money we even spend uh, in reality on on military, but you know certainly much more than any other nation, right? And and so right. we. This becomes a source of American pride. This fact that we are, you know, we're the, we're right. the biggest bully on the planet, right? And that's, uh, you know, and, right. and somehow that becomes a badge of honor that people want to carry around. You know, we're, and, and really, it's to me, it's kind of embarrassing being a former yeah. service member and, and, and knowing, yeah. you know, when I was when I was a kid, when I was 18 years old, and I raised my right hand and I said, you know, I, yeah, I want to serve my country. You know, I was I was ignorant. I didn't know what I was serving. I didn't know whose interest I was serving. I thought I was fighting for freedom, and that's the narrative that they'll give me today. That's what and, my mom thought when she was working for the Army Corps of Engineers. You know, she was, uh, you know, she had uh, she had to put um, when she was working for the government. Um, the one part of that phrase in the pledge that they had her do it was you know, reciting it was, I will uh, protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Unfortunately, our own government has become our own enemy. That's right. And it's not just foreign enemies that have become our enemies, it's also our own government. So how can our government be exempt from that, but the other governments are not exempt from that. So, um, but what really, um, I guess the, um, what other issues have you been attracted to? I know you said the war on drugs. Thank you. That is my big issue because yeah. I want marijuana. Uh, legalized, not just you know, just for recreationally, but for medicinally, people who are suffering from medical conditions. I have medical conditions, you know, up the roof. Um, I'm diabetic. I have cirrhosis of the liver. Government drugs are really um, the worst. Uh, I'll have one more glass and then. Okay. Is that waiting on me? Take your time. Um, um, we'll, we'll wait until after the interview. Sorry about that. Um, so, what's your response to all that? I mean, with the government's, the governmentization of healthcare, of controlling the drugs, um, the flow of drugs coming to this country. Trump wants to build a wall to prevent illegals from coming into the country and drugs. And he says, well, we got an, um, an epidemic of opioids. So, I mean, we all know, first of all, we all know that everything the government does is ineffective, right? What the, I mean, they've clearly shown that they're not good at anything. So right. uh, we, need to, we need to just get the government out of business of doing anything. 
I mean, that's the end goal, right? Is we, we don't need right. the government in our lives. They, they, don't, they don't give us any value. They take from us, they steal from us, they abuse us, and uh, we, 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 don't, we don't need the abuse anymore. And so when you look at something like uh, drugs, and you know, I was uh, about, a, about two years ago, I went to the um, police academy and I was considering a, a career in law enforcement. And so that experience, spending uh, four months of doing nothing but training to be a police officer, I learned a lot of kind of the mentality that they teach and, and how, how focused law enforcement is on drugs and how much law enforcement operations revolve around this aspect of enforcing drug laws. And we all know how oppressive those are. I mean, th these, this is from drug users, uh, Obviously, there's no there's no victim, there's no crime, right? That's something right. that, that you hear a lot. But um, the police use drugs as an excuse to take away people's rights, and it's just it's ridiculous. Wow. It's gotten it's so out of control. Uh, and again, it, it, learning the the law enforcement training that I learned is we spent more time. They spent more time teaching us how to get around people's rights, how to violate people's rights without violating people's rights, and and I think that. Um, you know, the war on drugs just leads to this militarization, again, we get back to militarization of our police force, right? Our, our police force is no longer officer friendly who is there to serve and protect. We got SWAT teams it's, going from exactly, house to house. exactly right. We got bears going in, um, you know, those big vehicles that go in and, and you know, tear down uh, a lot of houses and everything. We just got today, Macomb County just uh, alerted everybody, I believe it was today, where uh, apparently they're going to pull people over on suspicion of drug possession. And it's the erosion of our rights. Yep, that's exactly what it is. It's, it, you know, we're, we're talking about, and you get specifically to something like marijuana, and we're talking about a natural substance. I mean, this is something that anybody can grow and use. I mean, it's a plant. Uh, how, do, how do you get around that? How, how, is, how has the government decided that they can tell us that we can't consume a plant that has medicinal qualities and all the other benefits that you can get from, from uh, marijuana? And yet the government thinks that they can tell us that it's illegal and we can't use it and they can put us in a cage for it. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the low hanging fruit at this point is, is uh, ending, decriminalizing marijuana, right? Obviously there's a right. trend in that right now. Uh, but, it, but that needs to go further. You can't stop it at, at marijuana. That's not where it ends. That's where it begins. So uh, my goal would be to, uh, to end the entire war on drugs. I, um, what about Trump's plan for a wall between the U.S. and Mexico? Where do you stand on that? I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's, uh, besides being a waste of our stolen money, right? It's, uh, first of all, we just know, again, government doesn't do anything effectively. So they can build the wall, they can do, you know, build it 100 feet high, it doesn't matter, they'll dig under it. Uh, I, I can tell you, uh, I used to have a, a company I used to work for, Guy was from uh, was a was an illegal immigrant. Worked for the company. Had all the fake documentation he needed to get hired. Everybody knew it. And uh, he went back to visit his mother in Mexico. And uh, in order to get back in the country, he went through uh, a tunnel that uh, came from uh, Tijuana, and he came up somewhere in San Diego, right? And right. So, what's what's a wall going to do? Is a wall going to stop that? No. Yeah. No, these, the wall is not going to be effective. Everybody knows the wall is not going to be effective. If, if they put a wall up, people are just going to find another way around it. So I, I just think it's a waste of time and, and money. And besides that, it's, it's immoral. I mean, it, why, do, why do people not have a right to, to move freely? Why, if I want, you know, I can't have, uh, on my own private property, I can't have the guests that I choose because the government has told me that they're not allowed in our country. And I just think that fundamentally it's a, it's a bad policy. You know, um, one of the, I, I told my mom the other day that the reason why we have the Second Amendment, and this goes into the Second Amendment because I've always been pro-Second Amendment, just like you have been. And one of the reasons, one of the founders, one of the reasons, and I told her this, one of the reasons why the founders outlined the Second Amendment, the militia meant 
individual human beings, not necessarily the police, because the left has screwed this up into creating this idea, well, we got to have the police owning guns only. And the biggest problem here is the idea is that's the reason why we need to bring home the troops because they would come here to fend off invaders who are um, who may be looking to invade the homeland our military was not created to go abroad in search of monsters to destroy as john quincy adams said thomas jefferson said peace friendship and commerce with all nations entangling alliances with none that was the whole idea behind it bring home our troops and protect our second amendment rights but also protect and um, the citizens from incoming invaders whether they're domestic or foreign what do you say to that i say i, I agree with it 100 percent. we knew we know that the founders were against the idea of a standing army right we know that that's not something that was ever envisioned for this country and it's it's just become the new normal right or i mean it's it's our our normal now is that we have a standing army that's in countless countries across the world doing who knows what until we see it on the news uh and it's you know we we have no need for a standing army if we're like you said if we're, we're being uh you know peaceful and trading with foreign countries instead of having these in, entangling alliances why do we need an army? Who, who, what enemies are we creating? You know, we know that our, our military as it is now, it, it makes us less safe. You know, it creates more enemies. And we, right. we know that. I mean, if, if, you, if you don't know that, then you're just not paying attention. So, uh, you know, we need, we need to end, we need to stop sending troops overseas. We need to bring troops home. Uh, I, I would be... Uh, say content i guess um with if we had a small standing army for for defense uh for you know defense of the uh, nation um but quite frankly i don't think we need it i think uh like you said we the the second amendment is in place for a reason it's to uh the, because we know that the only way to truly defend our country is through an armed populace who exactly who is ready to to you know, protect their own property is essentially what it is. And our founders, whether people realize this or not, they were uniquely libertarian on just about a lot of issues. Yes, we had slavery. Those were the horrible things that we endured. Um, but America went through its growing pains and we eradicated slavery. But we didn't separate, but we didn't have the civil war because of the slaves we ended up having the civil war because of taxes so um i guess my question to you is of all the taxes that we have right now what do, um what taxes should we get rid of other than the, of the um uh, the income tax and what departments would you get rid of and are there any departments you would keep so uh, you know certainly the income tax would be the first you know the first thing that needs to go we've had uh, the country and, and our infrastructure survive for many many years without uh, any type of income tax um, I think that the idea of getting rid of taxes is it's not something that we could uh, quit cold turkey, right? We can't just say, okay, no more income tax, and now we're going to figure it out. This, everything, everything needs to be pulled in, right? You need, to, you need to reduce spending so that you can cut the taxes and continue to reduce spending and cut the taxes. So things like, um, you know, Department of, uh, of Education, obviously that can go, right? Uh, Department of Agriculture, Department uh, Energy and Energy, Commerce, all, they can go we know out the door. Tr transportation, all these these departments that uh, you know function already on the state level. Uh, you know, most of the stuff is done on the state level. The federal government just adds another layer of bureaucracy, right? So we don't need right. that. So those uh, get rid of them immediately. Um, 
there's no, there's just no need for it, and you have instant savings right there. Uh, so, in, in fact, I saw something today where Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos is uh, is rumored to be considering resigning because she doesn't have as much influence it as she had hoped she would. So, what does that tell you? It's a, it's a useless position. It doesn't do anything, right? That that whole department is useless, uh, especially on the federal level. So. Um, so yeah, so there's there's a lot of departments like that that just need to be eliminated right away. Uh, we would have to figure out budget wise, and I haven't I haven't. I didn't know she was considering resigning, but that's a good thing she's doing. <laughs> yeah, I, I I just read that today, so we'll yeah. see how that plays out. But um, you know, again, it's it needs to be a process of drawing back, cutting spending, cutting taxes, cutting spending, cutting taxes, till you get to the point where we can eliminate the income tax, and then we can look at other ways. You know, and, and eliminating the military and bringing the military home is a huge chunk of that, right? So, right. Um, you know, I... And I, put our veterans into the marketplace, you know. Um, let them use their experiences, you know. I'm in favor, if we could, use a, a private security firms um, that respond to threats. Um, if we need a transportation safety administration, why not simply privatize it? Why not simply just, you know, have a, or competing firms that have, you know, um, different firms that would com compete for customers' interests in protecting them from threats like, um, terrorists or from say ISIS or what have you right and the you know the funny thing about that is that what what are terrorists gonna have to fight against if we just leave their countries and we leave leave everybody else alone yeah that's what people don't you know you want to end terrorism well stop stop going in somebody else's backyard and pretending like you own it right if I came over to your house and I started bossing you around and telling you what to do and threatening you with weapons of course you're gonna be upset and this nonsense that Republicans are going around saying, well, we got to do something about those nukes that North Korea. But wait a second, weren't you pro Second Amendment? Because nukes count as part of the Second Amendment indiscriminately, regardless of how you may disagree with the use of, of the nuke. That's what we're supposed to. We're, we're supposed to use, you know, we're, we're supposed to use arms to protect ourselves. So, what do you say to that? I, you know, that that's kind of a question that, uh, discussion that I've had a lot of times is when we talk about the Second Amendment and where does it end, right? So, where does it end? Well, it doesn't end with a rifle. It doesn't end with a handgun. Uh, the Second Amendment is clear. It says, it shall not be infringed. If I want to own a tank and I have enough millions of dollars to own an M1 Abrams tank, I should be able to park it in my garage, right? Why, why shouldn't I? Why should the government have the monopoly yeah. on being the only one who can, who, who can have a tank? I, want, I mean, I, I, like, I like my cars, but I'd rather have a tank, right? Well, who wouldn't? <laughs> so, uh, you know, and that, so, uh, yeah, so the, yeah. The, the natural extension and progression and of that is, is into nuclear weapons. And that's, you, you're right. Where, where does it end? Well, it ends with whatever weapon anybody else in, can have, I can have. And whatever we can have, another country can have. And why, right. why have we put ourselves in a position where we feel like we get to tell the rest of the world what to do? And then before long, they're going to tell us what weapons we can have and we cannot have. That's right. And Republicans haven't figured out that message. And even the Democrats haven't figured that out. Yep. So, That's right. um, what about, say, like things like uh, vices, like um, prostitution or right? Thing. It's all you know. Any of those things, uh, uh, no gambling. Again, we get to we get to the idea of you know uh, adults should be able to be adults and make adult choices, right? And what? Right. Who am I to tell you what you can do with your free time? Right. I can't. Right? I mean, I could, but it, it it wouldn't have any force. It wouldn't have any meaning, right? Because I don't own you. 
You own right. you. You get to make those decisions. And so when it comes to any type of vice crime, where there's, where there's no criminal, there's or I'm sorry, when there's no victim, there's no crime. That's so to. to finish up here, do you have like any other thoughts you want to share or anything you would like to say in, at the end of the interview? I think we've touched on pretty much everything. You know, I, pr I appreciate you giving me the opportunity, the forum to give you some, some answers. Um, Give me some uh, some practice doing some interviews too. You know, I could. It's. I think that'll be helpful. I hope to do a lot more interviews. So, um, you know, I'm just excited for this opportunity, this race. Uh, I'm. I'm really hopeful that we're going to get the signatures we need to get on the ballot. Um, it's, a, it's a huge stumbling block. I can't wait to the point where we get that, where we can make that filing and it's official and we're on the ballot. As soon as we know we're on the ballot, this this race is going to be a blast we're going to have a four if we if i will tell you this the day a libertarian capital l libertarian candidate gets elected to say the u.s house senate governor state senate state rep and even president is the day our party blows the rooftop off the Democrats and the Republicans. It tells them we are a bigger choice than those two, th those two clowns. That's right, they can't continue to ignore us. And you just look at something like the election we had yesterday, and I don't know how many it was, 12 to 15 candidates, I think, across the country, various uh, local elections won. And you can't ignore that. You just can't ignore the fact that we're getting candidates in office and that is that trend is going to continue if there so. was a question about whether whether or not uh gary johnson's campaign was a fluke or whether or not the libertarian party was going to lose momentum after 2016 i think that yesterday answered that question and i think this momentum is going to carry and it's going to carry us into 2020 and and I'm i really think so about. too and with all the libertarians being now being elected it's because uh, I remember when I first joined the party in September of 1999, nobody really ever thought about us. Nobody ever gave us a chance. No, no nobody ever bat an eyelash um, um, against us or for us. And you know, I think because of Ron Paul, who paved the way for this, and because of Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, and now you, you're going to carry us if you get elected. I swear to God, Michigan is going to be proud to have a senator, a sitting senator, who's fighting for us tooth and nail. And I think that would be a big difference. And I think that, I think that when people got an opportunity to see how a libertarian acted in office, I think that that would wake up countless people. We would have so many people that would see, wait a second, you mean a politician can actually represent what the people want and what the people need? You know, that's it, right now it's unheard of. You, I mean, you think about it, they, they claim to be representing what we want and what we need. And, and those of us that, that know better, know better. Um, but if, if people got an opportunity to see what it what a true libertarian in office could do and the kind of difference that a libertarian could make and and just even just having a voice at that level knowing that knowing that the chances of getting uh, anything you want done are, are you know not all that great you know a libertarian can get some stuff done certainly but the big target items you know obviously it takes more than one to do but when people see that and they see what type of difference a libertarian can make in representing them and representing what they need and what they want I think it wakes up a ton of people and the floodgates right. will open and I'm telling you right now free market capitalism mixed with protection of civil liberties and with all of our rights with private charity and a very very small government as envisioned by the founders I think you are the ideal candidate, sir. We're gonna get we're gonna give it a shot. 
we're, we're going to do the best job we can. Thank you very much for this interview. All right. Thank Brian. you. Thank you. And thank you very much.